thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. I'm not used to using microphones, as some of you will know, but I'm not used to quite such a large number of you either. <laughs> um, the other thing is, uh, is, is the view of the slides all right? Because I will actually need to refer to some of, the, some of them in some detail, and I want to make sure that you can see them. Do we need the light a little bit lower? Yes. Could we have the lights a little bit lower? <laughs> Is that better? Okay. okay. Um, so I've called all my talks on this subject, <laughs> The Search for Richard III, so I've called this one that uh, with, 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 as a sort of title slide. But what I'm really focusing on is... Um, oh, let me just see if I can... Yeah. What I'm really focusing on is the four strands of evidence that I think I contributed to the search for Richard III. Um, and there are some pictures there which you can try and work out for yourselves, perhaps, first, what the four strands of evidence are going to be. Or if that's a little bit difficult, I'll give you um, a written version. <laughs> The first strand of evidence that I think I contributed to the search for Richard III's remains um, was new evidence to confirm that Richard III really was buried at the Leicester Grey Friars. Secondly, I think I contributed uh, evidence to show that the very widely believed story that Richard III's body had been dug up at the Reformation and thrown into the River Saw was rubbish. Thirdly, um, I think I contributed some knowledge about medieval friaries and how they were planned and laid out um, in order to uh, make a guess, anyway, at where amongst the three Leicester car parks that we had available, the church remains were likely to be found. And fourthly, as many of you will know already, um, I contributed my publication of a DNA sequence, a mitochondrial DNA sequence for Richard III. Now, I'll deal with these four strands of evidence one by one, but before I get into them, I am, of course, a historian, so I'm concerned with time, and um, I'm going to look a little bit at the chronology. I'm not going to look um, at this sort of in this introductory bit at the details of the evidence I produced, but at the chronology, because I think this is important. Basically, the University of Leicester and Leicester City Council have become involved in the search for Richard III in the last two years or so. It goes back a little bit beyond that, but basically we're talking about two years. But my involvement in the search for Richard III <laughs> began ten years ago in 2003. Um, it began at a conference that I attended in Mechelen, in Belgium, to commemorate the 500th anniversary of the death of Margaret of York, Duchess of Burgundy, and Richard III's sister. And uh, it followed on in the following year when I first made contact with a living all-female line descendant of Richard III's eldest sister, Anne of York, Duchess of Exeter. In 2005, that living descendant gave a DNA sample which was analysed so that Richard III's DNA had been sequenced for the first time. And in 2006, I published for the first time in a journal that I'm sure you won't, most of you have heard of, but it's called The Ricardian, <laughs> I published Richard III's mitochondrial DNA sequence, 2006. Uh, in 2004, meanwhile, an institution called the BBC, do we have any representatives of that organisation here? Uh, an institution called the BBC commissioned me to write a piece for a website they were setting up called, called Local Legends. And they asked me to write about the story that Richard III's body had ended up in a river. In 2005, 
I already had a fair amount of evidence suggesting where I thought Richard III's body could reasonably found, be found. And in that year, encouraged by somebody you may have heard of called Philippa Langley, um, I put forward a proposal to Time Team. And the letter that I wrote to Time Team is on the screen in front of you, or part of it. Um, and Time Team, as you know, I, I, I'm sure, usually allow three days for their excavations. And they were very interested in this project that I put to them. But they said, we only have three days. It's probably not long enough. Knowing, as we do now, that Richard III's body was found on the first day of the excavation, <laughs> Time team are probably kicking themselves. <laughs> um, my time team proposal included this photograph, which I didn't take myself, but it was taken for me by Diana Courtney, whom I, I don't know whether Diana is here today. Is she? Well, Diana, Diana is um, a Ricardian who lived in Leicester. And she took this photograph for me. She took several photographs of the car parks. Um, but I chose this one because I thought this was the site where the church was. And I'll come back to this photograph in a minute. But I sent this photograph to Time Team in 2005. Between 2004 and 2007, I published five articles on my search for and discovery of the DNA link. And this discovery also got some reporting in the British press. And uh, between 2008 and 2009, I was working on Richard III's epitaph and Richard III's tomb, the tomb that was created for him in 1494 to 5 by Henry VII. And um, that also, um, as you'll see in due course, was. Uh, important in terms of the evidence that I produced. And uh, also uh, in, in that period, 2008 to 2009, um, I actually found then amongst, uh, amongst the material that I was researching on the tomb, a new piece of evidence, a piece of evidence that hadn't previously been published to show that Richard really had been buried at the Leicester Greyfriars. I'll come to the detail of this in a moment. In 2009, I completed the first edition of my book, The Last Days of Richard III, which brought all this evidence together in one place. Um, and at about that time, I was also invited by Philippa to go up to Edinburgh and to uh, address the Scottish branch of the Richard III Society. And um, encouraged by Philippa, as you will see in a moment, I, 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 we then tried to do more things to, to, to get the physical search for Richard III underway. But just to remind you, my book included, again, the photograph of where I thought the Greyfriars Church would be found. It also included my analysis of John Speed's map of 1611, uh, which showed why I thought the story of the body in the river was rubbish. And it also included, again, um, the full publication of Richard III's mitochondrial DNA sequence, a full publication, not, um, not just showing that Richard III be be belonged to uh, mitochondrial DNA haplogroup J, but also showing the subgroup to which he belonged. So the full DNA sequence was published in the first edition of the book. In about 2010, <laughs> I went off to Turkey. I, before I went, Philippa had asked me, she'd given me a contact address in the University of Leicester and encouraged me to write to them. Uh, to see if they would be interested, since Time Team had turned the project down. Um, but unfortunately, the University of Leicester never answered my letter in 2010. So in 2010, I went off to work in Turkey uh, at a university there uh, for a couple of years. Um, and meanwhile, Philippa and Annette were still in England, but we were working together with this, this wonderful thing called uh, the internet, which enables you to keep together even if one of you is in Turkey. 
So I was emailing um, evidence to Philippa when she needed it, and we were trying to advance the project of the search for Richard III. So this is the chronology. Now, let's come back to the four strands of evidence that I think I produced. And to remind you, the first strand was the evidence that Richard III really was buried at the Leicester Grey Friars. There were some well-known pieces of uh, evidence in support of this idea. For example, Henry VII's historian, Polydor Virgil, um, this is an English version of his text, but um, he, he said they took Richard's body to the Franciscan Priory in Leicester, and there, after two days, he was buried. So this was one piece of evidence. And a second piece of evidence was from John Rouse, who um, specified that Richard III was buried in the east end of the church, the choir of the Grey Friars Church, which I've marked on this slide, but I'll come back and look at the layout of the church in a bit more detail in a moment. So there was evidence, roughly contemporary evidence, suggesting that Richard III was buried at the Grey Friars in Leicester, but some historians had questioned this. In my work on Richard III's tomb, I found a new source um, which was related to Henry VII's commission of a royal tomb for Richard III in 1494. And th this text had not previously been published, as far as I am aware. Uh, but it said, in the Church of Friars in the town of Leicester, where the bones of King Richard III rest, that was where the tomb was to be erected. So this seemed to me to show that by 1494, at the very latest, Richard III was in a friary church in Leicester. And coupled with the evidence from Virgil and from John Rouse, I thought that this was enough to go on, that we should be looking at the Grey Friars site in Leicester. Here we have um, the image of my reconstruction of the Leicester Grey Friars Church again, and I'll just um, say a word or two about that, because friary churches <coughs> were very standard in their layout in the late Middle Ages, um, and this church has an east end, the choir, which I've highlighted with a red arrow, which is where we are told by Rouse that Richard III was buried. Um, at the western end, it has a nave, and between them, it has what is called a, a walking place, or a slip, uh, which gave access through an archway into the cloisters. And this was really partly a practical thing. It was, it, it was a, um, a means for the friars to have food and other resources delivered into the priory. The nave of the church was open to the public, the choir was not open to the public. The cloisters were not open to the public under normal circumstances. These are important facts, and I'll come back to them later. I've also put here an image of a tomb, which uh, suggests, I think, very accurately what the tomb that Henry VII uh, created in 1494 to 5 for Richard III would have looked like. This is an alabaster tomb made in Nottingham, and uh, these were very standard for the period, um, and many aristocrats and even upper-middle-class people commissioned tombs of this type. This particular effigy is actually the effigy of Richard III's brother-in-law, John de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk. His tomb and the tomb of his wife, Elizabeth of York, Duchess of Suffolk, survives at Wingfield Church in Suffolk. And um, in this photograph, I've cut Elizabeth out of the picture, I'm afraid, and focused just on John de la Pole because I think that the effigy of him, which dates also from about 1495, suggests very much what Richard's royal tomb would have looked like. Okay, so I think I, I thought I'd established that Richard III had been buried in the Grey Friars in Leicester. So what was the problem? Well, the problem, obviously, was the long-standing legend that we had 
that Richard's body had been dug up at the dissolution of the Greyfriars and thrown into the River Thor. So we now move on to our second strand of evidence, um, the evidence that I produced to show that this story was not believable. I found that the story, the first written version of the story, dated from about 1611 and uh, was produced by the mapmaker John Speed. John Speed was in Leicester at about that time, drawing a map and finding places of interest in Leicester. And while he was here, um, he went to the Greyfriars site, he said, and looked for Richard III's tomb, or Richard III's grave. But he couldn't find anything, there was no sign of a grave, and the ground was covered with weeds and nettles, was what he wrote. And then, having not found a tomb or any sign of a grave, he went on to produce the story that Richard III's body had been dug up at the dissolution. But he didn't say that it had been thrown into the river. He said that it had been reburied under Bow Bridge. Bow Bridge, of course, had historical, associa historical associations with Richard III because it's said to be the bridge that he rode over on his way out of Leicester to Bosworth, and it's also said to be the bridge that his body was brought over back into Leicester um, after his death. Well, if you look at Bow Bridge today, it doesn't help us very much because it's a Victorian cast iron construction, um, and it would probably be quite easy to bury a body under it if you were so minded. But if you look at pictures of the old Bow Bridge, the one that John Speed would have known, it looked like this. And when I looked at these pictures, I immediately questions formed in my mind about the idea of burying a body under this bridge. Because you can see that the arches are very low and that all of them are filled with water. There are no arches that are on land. So it didn't seem to me to be a very likely story, that, um, a very believable story, that one would have buried a body under this bridge. I was also a little bit perturbed by the fact that there is no widespread evidence at the time of the dissolution that bodies were disturbed in, British, in English monasteries. Occasionally bodies were moved by family members in their tombs and reburied in a parish church in order to keep the tomb intact. But on the whole, if you do um, archaeology in, uh, on the site of a former monastic or friary church, you find burials still intact. The tomb superstructure has gone, but the underground part of the burial has not been touched. So those two pieces of evidence already suggested to me that Speed's story was not believable. But the key thing was when I looked at Speed's map of Leicester, um, and this map had been around since it was published in 1611, but no one previously seems to have noticed that what Speed marked as the Greyfriars site, and it's uh, where I've put the red arrow on the map here, was actually not the Greyfriars at all, but the Blackfriars. It was the site of Leicester's Dominican Priory, not the Franciscan Priory. The real Greyfriars site was much further south, um, and I've marked it with a, a purple arrow. But you can also see that Speed didn't label it at all. He was not aware that this was a monastic site, apparently. So the first thing is, no wonder he couldn't find anything but weeds and nettles, because he was looking in the wrong place. If he had been looking in the right place, he might have found something. This is Alderman Sir Robert Herrick, uh, former mayor of Leicester, and in 1611, he owned the real Greyfriars site. He had uh, had a house constructed for himself on the site of the domestic buildings of the Priory, but the area which had been the church 
he had had laid out as a garden. I think uh, Herrick's dates are also interesting because he was born in 1540, two years after Henry VIII dissolved the Grey Friars. At the time when Herrick was a boy in Leicester, it is very possible um, that he will have seen the rotting remains of Richard III's alabaster tomb in the then ruthless <coughs> ruins of the Grey Friars Church. There is every reason to suppose that Herrick would have known Richard III's tomb site. Um, this is obviously not his garden because it's gone, but it's a, it's a <coughs> supposedly Jacobean garden. And in this garden, which he laid out on the site of the church, Herrick erected a column three feet high with an inscription that says, here lies the body of Richard III, sometime King of England. Notice the present tense of the verb, here lies. Herrick thought the body was still underneath the site where he put this pillar. And if only John Speed had gone to the right site in 1611, he would have seen this column and read this inscription, and probably we would never have had the story of the body in the river. In the recent excavation of the Greyfriars site, it was interesting because we found evidence of Herrick's garden. These are medieval floor tiles from the Greyfriars, but they're not at a medieval ground level, and they're not in the medieval buildings. They had been dug up, and Herrick's workmen had used them to make a garden path. This is one of Herrick's garden paths on a site where there was no building in the Middle Ages, but quite near the church and not far from where his three-foot-high pillar would have stood. My third strand of evidence uh, relates to my predictions regarding the layout of the friary site. As I said... Friaries in medieval, late medieval Europe were very standard in their layout. This is the former Blackfriars Church in Norwich. If you're ever in Norwich, it's worth visiting because it's very well preserved. It's probably the best preserved friary site in England. And it gives us a good idea of what the Leicester Grey Friars may have looked like. In 2011, however... Leicester archaeologists, some of whom were involved in the eventual dig at the Greyfriars site, published this reconstruction of the Leicester Greyfriars. And uh, I've highlighted here where they placed the Friary Church. They've placed it on the south side of the site, adjacent to the town wall. On the opposite side of the site, the north side of the site, there was, in the Middle Ages, a main road, which I've highlighted in red. I said to you before that friars had the vocation of preaching to the people, and the naves of their churches were open to the public. They therefore normally built their churches somewhere accessible, and if possible, near a road. The reconstruction of the Leicester archaeologists seemed to me incredible because to get from the road to the church, you would have had to go through the cloisters, which if you were not a friar, you could not do. It was inaccessible to you. Therefore, I didn't believe in this reconstruction and I thought that the church should lie on the opposite side of the site to the north, where I've now put the building. And this is also where my photograph sent to Time Team in 2005 had shown the building. And this is the photograph. And you can see towards the back of the photograph there is a man getting into a white van who is looking at me a little bit puzzled, probably wondering <laughs> why I'm taking a photograph of the car park. Um, I've <laughs> just fired a green arrow at him. Uh, he's, 
this man is standing more or less on Richard III's gravesite. This was the photograph that I sent to Time Team in 2005, saying where I thought the church was. Interestingly, when <laughs> Philippa and Annette and I saw this site in 2011, when the ground penetrating radar search was done, um, that was the first time that any of us, well, the first time that I had seen the car park with no cars in it. Um, and surprisingly, one could actually read the tarmac. I say read because on this point there was an inscription, uh, there was a letter R painted on the tarmac. And uh, I had with me my photograph, um, my, uh, sorry, the oil painting of Richard III that I'd commissioned and which I was presenting to Leicester Cathedral. It's in Leicester Cathedral now. Um, uh, I had it with me uh, on this particular day, and I also, as one does, had Richard III's <laughs> royal standard with me. So um, we, partly as a joke, laid them on the tarmac and took this photograph. Um, I think the letter R actually probably referred to reserved. But um, it, interestingly, this was the site beneath which the grave was found. Very quickly, we'll move on to um, put the uh, reconstruction in position. This is the reconstruction of the friary um, uh, as suggested by the archaeological team. I would differ with it slightly. I would take out the blue bit at the end of the nave and I would add an aisle and a porch in red, which I've done here. Why? Because, again, I'm looking at other friary buildings. This is Clare Priory in Suffolk, which some of you will know, um, where members of Richard III's family are buried. Uh, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, Edmund Mortimer are buried here. And you can see, in many ways, it's very similar, but it has a north aisle. And I think, therefore, um, I've highlighted the aisle for you in blue. I think, therefore, that... Uh, it's quite possible that the Leicester Greyfriars also has a north aisle, had a north aisle. But you can see that from where the trenches were, um, we didn't do any excavating on the nave site. All the excavation was on the site of the cloisters and the choir, um, highlighted here in blue. So we still actually are guessing. I'm guessing about the nave, and the Leicester archaeologists are guessing. And maybe one day we'll find out. The grave site is marked here with a big black cross, and this is the grave as it, it looked um, on the afternoon when it was finally fully excavated. And moving on quickly to my last strand of evidence, the DNA evidence. The DNA evidence um, was initially, the search for it was initially undertaken, as I say, uh, in connection with possible remains of Margaret of York, Richard III's sister. Because we were looking at, a f at female bodies, I followed a female line DNA, mitochondrial DNA, um, and not Y chromosome DNA, because my, uh, Margaret of York would not have had a Y chromosome. On my computer over the next several years, because actually research went on after I found Joy Ibsen to try and find other lines, um, a, a family, an enormous family tree grew following female lines of descent from Richard III's sisters and from also from his numerous aunts, the sisters of his mother, Cecily, Cecily Neville. And uh, this is part of the family tree as I finally found it, leading from Cecily Neville down through a whole multitude of Barbaras um, to a lady called Barbara Gough Calthorpe, who lived at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And if we follow that on from Barbara Gough Calthorpe, then it takes us down to a lady called Joy Muriel Brown. I was a bit appalled when I found her surname was Brown. It could have been Smith, I suppose, but <laughs> Brown was not a very encouraging name to, uh, uh, um, to seek out. But then fortunately, I found that her mother had left a will which had an address in it and also a married name, Ibsen, which was a bit less common. So... Um, in 2004, I, with great nervousness, picked up a telephone and rang Joy Brown, Joy Ibsen in Canada. 
Uh, I handled it as carefully as I could. I was thinking of how I might handle a request from an unknown person in a foreign country for a sample of my DNA. <laughs> <coughs> But Joy, ha uh, Joy had a journalistic background and an interest in family history. She had no idea that she was descended from the House of York, uh, but she was interested. She asked for some time to think about it, and a week later she wrote me a letter saying, yes, she would give a DNA sample. And this was the DNA sequence as I initially published it. This is the basic DNA sequence showing the um, basic DNA haplogroup. Now... DNA sequences can have different appearances. This one is all in terms of letters, A, T, C, and G. These are abbreviations for the nucleotides, um, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine, which make up DNA. If I were to put my DNA sequence on the screen, or Carolyn's, or Phil Stone's, or Philippa's, it would probably look more or less the same as this. The key point about this DNA sequence are the two letters that are in red, because they are special to this haplogroup. All the other letters might be the same for everybody in this room. I'll come back to that in a moment. <clears throat> Having found Joy Ibsen, I got into correspondence with her um, over a number of things. We shared an interest in poultry and natural history and all sorts of other things. We didn't just chat about DNA. Sadly, she died in 2008 from cancer, and so she wasn't around when we started the um, actual archaeology in Leicester. But it was her son, Michael, who lives in London, England, not London, Ontario, um, who came to Leicester. And here he is giving a DNA sequence to Dr. Turi King, the geneticist at Leicester University, at the start of the dig. And this is the DNA sequence as published by Dr. Kurt Turiking um, at the press conference at the beginning of the, uh, uh, at the official announcement. And you can, I'm sure, see immediately that it looks exactly the same as what I published. Yes? Yes? <laughs> no. Because she's showing the DNA sequence in a different way, and I've seen lots of interesting discussion of this in the press. Um, people saying, well, are the, point, are, are the, um, are the points uh, actually exactly the same, the points of the graph for Richard III and Michael Ibsen, or are there some differences? Well, we don't need to worry about that, because what Turi is doing is she is showing the, mitoch the mitochondrial DNA sequence in colour code. The shape of the points is not important. What is important is the colour. If it's black, it's guanine. If it's red, it's thymine, and so on. Let's have a look. This is guanine. This is thymine. It's like a barcode, um, colour-coded, and you don't need to bother about the height of the points or the shape of the graph. If we reduce a small section of the DNA, as Turi published it, two letters... Um, you can see that it begins to look more like what I've published. This bit is T-A-T, G-T-A, T-T-T. T-A-T, G-T-A, T-T-T. And here it is in my published sequence, T-A-T, G-T-A, T-T-T. It's exactly the same. The information that Turi was presenting was exactly the same. But remember, I said that we needed to focus on the two letters in red. Um, nucleotide number 69 needs to be a T, and nucleotide number 126 needs to be a C. Well, the display that Turi showed um, on the official announcement didn't include the first of those, but the second was there, and here it is. Remember the colour code? And I've translated Turi's display into letters for you. It doesn't go beyond the letter C, unfortunately, but it does correspond to what I published. And nucleotide number 126, for me and for Turi, was a C, cytosine. This tells us that Richard III be belongs to mitochondrial DNA haplogroup J, it shows us that his maternal line of descent is from a clan mother 
whom geneticists call Jasmine. She lived in the region of modern Syria about 10,000 years ago. Her descendants are thought to have introduced farming to Western Europe. About 17% of modern Europeans are jasmine descendants, but Richard belongs to a rare subgroup of this jasmine group, and only about 1.5 of living human beings belong in Richard III's subgroup. So it is actually quite, a, quite an important um, thing to have a mitochondrial DNA match in this mitochondrial DNA subgroup. And Richard III's ancestors came from Syria. A long time ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, my experience um, of some aspects of this research have been mixed in the last few months, I have to say. There have been questions about the ownership of the discovery, and some people have been rather possessive about this. Um, and sometimes I've felt a bit as though I'm confronting the Tudors. <laughs> um, you already know that uh, Philippa, in particular, had a very uphill struggle to get the search, the practical search, underway. Um, some people expressed opinions in the early days of the search with, which have resulted in hats, I believe, now being on their menu. <laughs> and some of us, Philippa, myself, and others, actually spent quite a lot of our own money on this research. All the DNA research um, prior to 2010 was done at my expense. And getting a DNA sequence from a living sample is not that expensive, but getting a DNA sequence from Edward IV's hair, or trying to, could actually be quite expensive, and it was. So, but in the end, although I, uh, uh, my reactions in the last few months have sometimes been a bit up and down, we have found Richard III. We do know what he looked like. And I think my four strands of evidence helped to get us there. Thanks ever so much, uh, John, for what I thought was Questions? an absolute, yeah, superb speech. Um, we got anybody who'd like to ask John any questions? I'm sure there are people who have a couple of thoughts. So. No, I silenced them all, you see. <laughs> ah. Yeah, we'll take one from here, if that's all right. I think we need the lady... Yes. Oh, could we repeat the question, actually, so everyone could uh, to hear that? What, what the, question, you... the question was, is there anything to be said about the missing molars? Some of you may already know that some of Richard's teeth were missing. Um, I have sent to Dr. Joe Appleby the article that I published on missing molars um, in and around the royal family, because some of you probably know that Anne Mowbray had missing molars. There are reports that the anonymous remains in the urn in Westminster Abbey had missing molars, um, and uh, there, there, are, there are other possible connections here. Um, so I sent all that information to um, Dr. Jo Appleby, and I hope that she will um, explore that. But work is still going on on various, on various aspects of this, so I don't can't tell you now. Yep. Speak as loud as possible. I think we've got the answer. Yeah. 
Everybody, I've been told to go back to the mic because they can't hear me. <laughs> I would like to thank you because I have read your books and they're fantastic. Um, have you given any thought to the two little boys that appear to be missing? Um, yes. Uh, at, at home, actually, in my bedroom, I have um, some hair of Henry VIII's sister, as one does. Um, and uh, the reason I have that there, it was given to me by um, a noble family in the north of England, whose name would not be unknown to you, but I'm not going to mention it. Um, uh, and it has a good pedigree. And uh, it would have been a potential source for the mitochondrial DNA of the real princes in the tower because um, Henry VIII and his sisters were children of Elizabeth of York, who was the sister of the princes in the tower, so they had the same DNA. Um, but I haven't got any further with that at the moment, and we may not need to now, because, of course, now having established Richard III's identity... Um, his whole DNA sequence can be used, not just his mitochondrial DNA. So we could actually use the, uh, the, the whole of his DNA sequence to see whether he is an uncle of the people um, buried in the urn in Westminster Abbey, if at any time we're allowed to open it. <laughs> There's a lady right at the top who's been waving her hand quite vigorously. <laughs> Probably finish actually. Yeah, be this good. will be the last question. I think. Uh, thank you, John, for the work you've done. I'm sure everybody here will, will agree with me. Um, I wonder, would you know whether at the end of when the 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 friary was suppressed? whether the land was actually deconsecrated, whether the church was deconsecrated. Because if it hadn't been deconsecrated, Richard, while may have been lying under a het car park, may still have been living, but he's still sort of not living, living? staying <laughs> in consecrated ground, as it were. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yes, I do. As far as I know, um, monastic churches um, were not deconsecrated so, so at, at the dissolution. Um, so I think there is every reason to believe that he ha has been lying in consecrated ground all along. And many Leicester social serv servants are pe parking their cars in consecrated <laughs> ground, exactly. which I'm sure they'd be glad to know. <laughs> John, don't disappear for a moment. At the AGM in October last year, we thanked Philippa and for her work we made her the Robert, gave her the Robert Hamblin Award. But we also announced that she was going to be made a life member, honorary member of the Richard III Society. I now wish publicly in front of you all to give the same to John. Thank you, Phil. I'm, I, I'm almost more overwhelmed now, I think, than I was in the car park. <laughs> um, I'm very proud to be a member of the Richard III Society and to know many of the people in this room and people all around the world who um, are in contact with me electronically. It's, um, it's a band that has um, an enormous atmosphere Yes, yes. Thank you.